Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You have tuned in to the Daily Roundup on this, a Friday, ooh, the 13th, January the 13th, that is, 2023. I'm David Menzies and my co-host, well, let me tell you a little bit about my co-host. Do you know, folks, that today is National Rubber Ducky Day? And you'd think that the rubber ducky would be so beloved, but... We hate how the left has appropriated this thing. More on that later. She is the she-devil with a sword. She is the Khaleesi of Northern Alberta. She is Sheila Gunn-Reed. How you doing there, Sheila? David, wait. The <laughs> left has appropriated the rubber ducky? Yes, indeed, my dear. And no. I'm, going to, I'm going to throw to super producer uh, Efren, who personally experienced how the left communicates with uh, journalists such as ourselves when we confound them with logic. Okay. Efren, can you kindly show the new communication tool by those Mensa members that comprise the progressive left and Antifa and so on? What exactly does the pig represent there? Do you feel like it's still justified to prevent unvaccinated people from flying on federal uh, flights right now? <laughs> There's no other government doing it right now in the world. There's no other government preventing unvaccinated people from flying. It's only Canada that's preventing the unvaccinated from flying in the country. No other country is doing that. <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather listen to those squeaky toys than those people. <laughs> More squeaky toys. I hope they adopt this for all their protests. Sheila, it's equal parts hilarious and pathetic. And it just goes to show if you don't, if you're not able to communicate your argument, right? If you're not able to communicate your point, if you have to shove an umbrella in a camera or now a uh, squeeze toy, um, then you don't have much of a point to begin with, do you? No. No. By the way, I was looking to see what other days it is. I was thinking it would be more exciting since it's Friday the 13th, but um, it's National Blame Someone Else Day. So <laughs> good news for Justin Trudeau, right? Every time he does something creepy, weird and gross, it's a learning experience for all of us. We all get to share in the blame. Um, and it is also National Sticker Day. And as you know, David, I love a good sticker. And what's the other one? A national public radio broadcasting day. Does anybody still listen to public radio broadcasting? I don't public, know. Public, like PBS, you mean? Or yeah, do people uh, still listen to PBS? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, with over-the-air radio in Toronto, it's so bad. I don't know what the situation is out in Alberta, Sheila. Uh, but to use the old Dick Beto's line, if some of these cats don't get off the air, I'm going to stop breathing it, okay? Um, that is really the reason 10 years ago, more, uh, that I bought a satellite radio. Same. Um, I'm, I am now freed from the tyranny of mediocrity, of political correctness, of wokeism. It is, with one or two specific hosts, Sheila, it is unlistenable. I mean, Toronto is the biggest market in Canada. And you when you see the tiny talent time uh, talking heads that they have lined up, it is actually shocking. Um, I, all I can think of is that Saturday Night Live phrase, the not ready for primetime players. So there's a lack of professionalism, a lack of experience, and then they are so hopelessly woke, you see them catching themselves in sentences so that they don't say anything that, you know, the pronoun spirit unicorn people at U of T might take uh, as offensive and they... Um, they do the self-censorship route, which, as I've always maintained, Sheila, is worse than censorship itself. Yeah, Alberta, same thing. I mean, it's not a Toronto-specific thing. It's just as bad out here. Thank goodness for satellite radio, podcasts, and audiobooks. Um, you guys still have Richard Surrett, which is good, in Toronto. He's great. Um, but and our last truly conservative radio host was Danielle Smith. She canceled herself because she couldn't say what she wanted to say. 
and then she became our premier. So, I mean, that that's basically it for us out here. Yes, Richard Serrett on uh, Saga 960. Uh, he is doing absolutely phenomenal work. If anyone wants to listen to him, his shift is 4 till 6. It's two golden hours. And then from 1 to 3, same station, Saga 960, um, the Mark Petroni show. Uh, yeah. Mark is doing a phenomenal job, and he's living in the um, the free state of Florida, uh, so he knows what it's like uh, to see the world as it should be or as we'd want it to be. But you're right, and that's a very small station, but I can tell you they're getting numbers and more uh, listeners every day. And, uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me about uh, Mark Petroni and uh, Richard Serrett. And one last thing on Rubber Ducky Day. I'm just dying for those left-wing lunatics to pull that stunt on me because what I carry around in my camera bag, Sheila, well, I went to Dollarama. Oh, look, it goes invisible. It's green. It's green. <laughs> it's green. <laughs> so I have an invisible pig. You can't see it, folks, but look. <laughs> You can hear it. Phantom pigs. So I'm Phantom. just going to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion like this. That is the intellectual capital of the left today, squeezing a green rubber piggy at a reporter's microphone. Uh, absolutely pathetic. So, Sheila, what is it we're just trying to do here? <laughs> it's a phantom oinking. <laughs> like the phantom honking. Um, yeah, what are we doing? Who even knows anymore? But this is the Rebel <laughs> News Daily live stream. It's hosted primarily by David, although I sometimes I sit in and co-pilot with him. And it's a great way for us to talk about the news of the day, entirely unscripted, obviously, um, and get some viewer feedback from you. You can sort of take the show in whatever direction you want by leaving us a paid chat. You can do that on Rumble and on Odyssey. However, those are not the only platforms that we're streaming on. So we're still on the censorship platform of YouTube, um, I think a little bit for spite, but also because we have 1.6 million YouTube subscribers and we don't want to abandon you if that's where you prefer to watch us. Fine, we're going to be there. But we're also on Twitter and Getter. Yep. And I think that's all five right now. Um, so again, if you want to support the work that we do and get involved in the show, leave a paid chat on Rumble. It's called the Rumble Rant on Odyssey. It's called a hyper chat. And I think that ties up all the loose ends uh let's maybe get into the first story and i'll let you pick david yes that would be well um as the saying goes speak of the devil and she shall appear no but i'm not calling daniel smith the devil of course um but we see that the alberta premier daniel smith is backing off on a promise to seek pardons for covid19 health violators oh no sheila say it ain't so joe what's going on here I don't know if it's she's backing off of a promise to seek pardons. However, that's being how it's being reported in the mainstream media. She's doing her best to walk a very fine line here. She's been very clear that she thinks these COVID prosecutions are a complete and total waste of stretched prosecutorial resources. But she also doesn't want to be perceived as though she were uh, Justin Trudeau reaching into the justice system and meddling with it for political reasons. So... You know, she's a proponent of prosecuting things that are, that are in the public interest. And she has said these COVID fines and tickets are definitely not in the public interest. But also she has to be allow the justice system to be independent of political meddling. So while she's doing her best to balance that, the media are claiming this as a victory Um against those COVID scoff laws who definitely have, you know, $80,000 in fines coming for just telling the health inspector, sh 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 shoo, get out of here. Well, as a matter of fact, Sheila, why don't we uh, give uh, Premier Smith uh, the courtesy of uh, putting a little video on here right now sure. where she says in her own words uh, what her plans are in terms of those uh, odious COVID-19 charges. Can we roll that, guys? All right, and then this one's for the Premier. Um, we just got word the Independence Party of Alberta is calling on you to make good on the commitment to see the charges dropped on the pastor in question with the vaccine, public health restrictions and things like that. Um, are you still planning to make good on your commitment to drop those charges? The, the way our, our system of, uh, of justice works is that we do have an independent justice department and independent Crown prosecutors, and I have asked them to consider 
all charges under the lens of is it in the public interest to pursue and is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction. Um, as we continue to see some of these cases go through, some of them get dropped, some of them fail, they have to com consistently recalibrate. But uh, I do want to make sure that they have an independent process for assessing that. But I ask them on a regular basis um, as new cases come out, is it in the public interest to pursue and is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? And so I'll, I'll leave the, the justice system to work, but I, I, do, I do think that's an important lens for us to be looking at these kinds of charges. Well, you know what, Sheila? Um, I think she's right. Leave it to the justice system to figure out uh, who's who in the zoo, so to speak. But it's funny. I see her critics. I even saw an um, inflammatory piece in the, the Calgary Sun um, condemning uh, Daniel Smith um, for even offering a little bit of an opinion on uh, what happened. And you know what? Um, maybe she should have said, well, I'm leaving it up to the justice system, full stop, period, next question. But then again, why can't we have people in charge that say what so many people feel that these were outrageous charges. Yeah. These were hypocritical charges. We're going after little, you know, small businesses while we let the the Costco's uh, and uh, the WalMarts of the world operate. Um, so I don't see this as a uh, a smoking gun scandal on her part at all. No, not at all. She's taking a very balanced approach, and she, like I said, she's trying to navigate some pretty murky waters. Um, and it's going to be tough for her, but it's not the scandal that the mainstream media says it is that she's she's a backing off and b meddling. Like, which is it? You can't be both. But you're seeing mainstream media reports saying, oh, she's completely backing off of offering pardons, but also simultaneously meddling completely in the justice system. Excuse me, <laughs> mainstream media, which one is it? I think yeah. she's probably doing neither. Um, but yeah. On the flip side of this, like, let's talk about how rabid and crazy these people are who still want these charges to be pursued. Alberta is short, best guesses, about 50 Crown prosecutors all across the province. And so what that means is that if they continue to push these COVID cases through the court system, which some of them are coming up on two years uh, now, maybe even a little bit more, we're reaching the constitutional limits on some of these things, but we're also using stretch prosecutorial resources to go after somebody who had too many people in their house over mm -hmm. Christmas while sexual assault, armed robberies, domestic violence, drug trafficking, human trafficking, murder. Um, those are all in jeopardy of being tossed out and real victims are not going to get the justice they deserve because somebody has a, uh, a real hate on for pastor art and so that's the reality of what's happening here so whether they think that these charges should be pursued or not daniel smith is right are they in the public interest if this takes precedent over a rape trial and again sheila um the question arises uh the likes of a pastor art for example what did he do? I'm still trying to figure out what did he do that was so egregious, so offside, so immoral, so against the law, because I just saw him helping people, preaching, yeah. feeding the homeless. Look, I, you know, I, I am baffled. I'm gobsmacked that this is the guy that Alberta considered to be public enemy number one in the first place. Yeah, and let's look at how he treats the homeless. So the people he helps are the people who are normally too, and I hate to use the word problematic because it's the language of the left, but too problematic for a homeless shelter. They've got too many troubles, too mentally ill, too violent, too, uh, too um, riddled with uh, drug abuse problems that they can't really be in a homeless shelter to get access to the resources there. But art takes care of them. And he doesn't just take care of them with like, oh, here's a almost expiring sandwich from the grocery store that they were going to toss in the garbage, but they gave to me. He cooks them steak dinners for Christmas. Uh, it might be the only time that these people are treated like a human on any given week. 
And that was criminalized as an illegal public gathering by the province of Alberta and the city of Calgary. Because I think art embarrasses them with his kindness to these forgotten people. And, and you know, Sheila, uh, it seems that virus is spreading. I remember with uh, super producer Efren before Christmas, uh, literally a week before Christmas, um, good Samaritans in the city of Oshawa, where there mm-hmm. is a homeless problem, I can tell you, as soon as you get off the 401, you can tell uh, that city in certain neighborhoods is on hard times. And those people were being fined uh, by bylaw for giving food, beverages, clothing, um, sanitary products like, you know, toothbrushes yeah. and toothpaste, et cetera. Um, I, it, you know, I, it, it's beyond belief that um, doing a good deed does not go unpunished in Canada these days. I, I, I can't make sense of it. Yeah, and when Art was really stepping up to help people, he he was doing it in a time where they were limiting shelter capacity to deal with COVID. So there were people even who would normally be able to go to the shelter who were out on the streets. And it's, you know, bitterly cold in Alberta most of the time in the winter. And he was helping those people too, the people who were tossed out for lack of a better term by the province he describes himself as a frontline worker and he probably is he's probably saving millions of dollars to the taxpayer every single year just by his outreach because he's keeping like he's doing the work that the the city says that they should be doing but you know when you're feeding somebody they're not stealing when you're giving them clothes they're not stealing when you are offering them outreach and uh, a helping hand and showing them that you care and that there's a different way and maybe come to my church and talk to my my people who can help you and connect you with resources, he's doing all of that. And the province in the city didn't have to. And so he's he is the point of contact to get people out of that horrible, horrible lifestyle. And still, they criminalize him for it. And not only did they criminalize him, Sheila, I want to touch upon very quickly about the vindictiveness. I saw on the monitor uh, our producers were running the video of Artur Podolsky being arrested. Oh, not at his home or his church, but on a live lane of highway um, in uh, slippery conditions. There you go, folks. Uh, uh, Like El Chapo. Can you imagine? Sheila, we know... Pastor Art isn't packing heat. Uh, The police know where he lives. The police know where he preaches. The police know where he feeds the homeless. And they chose um, basically, well, this is kabuki theater, isn't it? This is um, law enforcement showing how big, bold, and brave they are by taking down this felon uh, on a wet piece of uh, asphalt of uh, of a highway this could have ended really badly i think sheila and tell me what was the need for it this was a message to the other pastors this is a message to tim stevens don't get any more ideas tim yep. this is a message to james coates you know what 35 days in jail you and you were allowed to turn yourself in maybe you want an el chapo style takedown on the highway <laughs> next time Uh, This is a message to all those other pastors who were thinking, you know what? I am called by my faith to stand up to the state when the state is incompatible with my religion. I am called to shepherd my flock when the state is wrong. This was a message to them who, if they got any ideas that they were going to do the same, that this would happen to them too. You know what? I think your analysis, Sheila, is spot on. Uh, because there is um, no other explanation. This was an advertisement to any other criminals out there, you know, feeding the homeless, uh, preaching at their churches. Uh, If it happens to Art, it'll happen to you. We're going to make a spectacle of this. We're going to make you infamous on the Internet. This is shameful, and this is the wrong way that law enforcement should be running. I, and my only last question on this file, Sheila, is I wonder if the, there were people behind the scenes directing law enforcement to do this, because I have a hard time believing the Calgary uh, Police Service would think this is an appropriate way to arrest a nonviolent offender. 
you never know with the Calgary City Police brass. Yeah. Um, I know the boots on the ground cops, they're a little bit different. Some of them don't like to do this. For example, one of those um, cops who routinely went to Grace Life Church, um, one of them told me he comes because he doesn't want to go. And he didn't want the guys who did want to go going because then there would be a problem. Yeah. Um, so I think there are some of those cops out there, but I mean, we saw just the horrendous cop that arrested Tim Stevens quoting scripture to him. Um, so uh, completely out of context, by the way, but people who quote scriptures to pastors as you arrest them generally do get the context of the scripture wrong. Um, so the, I mean, but I can't imagine you go into policing to, um, you know, put on your, uh, your vest every day to, and your badge and your gun to make your community safer. And you're arresting the guy who fed the homeless too many homeless at once. Like that, that's what you went into policing to do. It's got to be a real morale problem right now in, I think policing in general, after what their superiors had them do over the last two years. And on that note, um, what I'll say, Sheila, I'll never forget, I bumped into a police officer's uh, wife when I was um, out covering a Adamson barbecue uh, event. There's there's another um, harsh criminal offense, eh, Sheila? Uh, yeah. Providing barbecue meat for hungry people that want to buy it. And, of course, John Tory sent in all the king's horses and all the king's men to shut that down. But... Um, she said at the division where her husband works, uh, it's based because I said, how do the police really feel about it? And she said, David, it's 50 50. Half are appalled. They don't think this is what they signed up for. They think this is abusive and half think, you know, they're doing God's work that, you know, these um, anti vaccine or vaccine choice people are a blight on society and they deserve everything coming. And it has created, at least at her husband's division, so I'm sure it's at other divisions too, and at other police forces too, uh, it's created an enormous amount of tension uh, between those police officers that say this is wrong to go after these people and the others that say lock them up. So that's the situation where, you know what, Sheila, I think we're overdue for our first ad break. And wait, oh my wait, goodness. wait, 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 before we move on from that, I just uh, was digging up some data because I remember reading about this and then I remember writing it up for the website. Calgary police morale is at a record low. And uh, they started off 2022 with uh, Calgary police morale being very, very low. Police chief uh, Newfeld called it heartbreaking. Uh, yeah, I guess when you're sending people who want to keep gangsters off the streets to arrest pastors in front of their crying children, that can weigh on a guy. Um, and it can also act like a poison across uh, the the police force in general. Um, and it does. It creates conflict between the members where some are loving this and some hate it. And the ones that hate it also start to hate the guys who love it. So we're, there's no... Uh, team anymore right you have these people who are, have opposing viewpoints and and opposing worldviews and it's out there ripped open for everybody to experience but as 2022 wrapped up guess what police, police morale remains low why because nothing changed you're still arresting pastors you're still arresting covid scoff laws and you're still wasting these cops time by the way because every time this stuff goes to court these cops have to go to court take the day off instead of fighting real crime to testify against a pastor Unbelievable. And I can tell you here in Toronto, Sheila, under John Tory's watch, uh, violent crime has risen by double digits. I'm not going to say yeah. what the exact number is because I forget. Riding the subway um, is something fraught with danger. I know young ladies who tell me that um, at nighttime, riding the subway alone, um, not going to happen. That never used to be a Toronto thing. That was kind of like a New York thing going back to the, the 70s. It was never a Toronto thing, Toronto the good. And you're right. Um, taking police officers off the streets to go after COVID-19 violators? Uh, give me a break. Get your priorities straight. Yeah, as Daniel Smith said, is this in the public interest? Is it in the public interest? It's not. She's right. 
Um, but I think that ties that up with the tidy little bow. Maybe we'll go to our ad break. <laughs> okay, then. The wannabe Martha Stewart, that is Sheila Gunn. Wannabe? <laughs> 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 Let's roll that ad, folks. We'll be right back. It's the values. You look at Western values in Western society, and these are values we could all relate to, but they're old world values of grit and community and perseverance. It's a place where you can make a living with your back and your hands and a little bit of hard work. And it's a place of opportunity. And I think as Albertans, we're fiercely protective of that. The world's energy crisis has been grabbing newspaper headlines. In a nutshell, we're running short of petroleum resources and the prices are zooming upwards. My colleagues in the government and I have come reluctantly to believe that the price of oil in Canada must go up. This was Alberta. The origin of the Alberta separatist movement begins with the election of Pierre Trudeau as prime minister. It was, it was a deliberate and malicious targeting of the West, which suited Pierre Trudeau just fine, just like it suits Justin Trudeau just fine. Sunny ways, my friends. Blackface. There is an actual hostile government that was Alberta. Why did your dad give everyone in Western Canada the middle finger? Really, in politics, you do have to make uh, big decisions. And whenever you make this big decisions, there's going to be people who agree with it and people who don't disagree with it. Plenty of people want to leave this country. It's not the kind of idea you'd expect to hear from someone who wants to win power and hold power. It's a it is a radical idea. And you would normalize the discussion. And so maybe Alberta wouldn't have to go because maybe the rest of the country and the rest of the world would say, whoa, don't go. Will you accept these changes instead? That's what happened for Quebec. There's no Maple Leafs west of the Manitoba borders. Why do we, want, why do we have a Maple Leaf by unilateral decision on the Canadian flag? Think of how the American colonists we're in 1775. That's how a lot of Albertans are today. You know, Sheila, I'm so excited about 2023 here at Rebel News. We're going to have more documentaries uh, debuting. And I got to say, I think the, the team is doing just a, a superb job uh, in the production of these documentaries. And also, more importantly, covering issues, covering news, covering events that the mainstream media has absolutely no appetite for. I mean, there was an example earlier this week, Sheila, as you know, on Wednesday, um, hundreds came out in support of Dr. Jordan Peterson outside of the Ontario um, uh, Psychology College. And with the exception of uh, our good friend at the Toronto Sun, Joe Warmington, um, I didn't see any other journalists, certainly no TV media, CTV, Global, uh, CBC. Oh, this is a nothing burger. And imagine that, Sheila, a nothing burger, freedom of speech, uh, i.e. freedom of expression, a dot, 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 freedom of the press. Um, but no, uh, that's not our thing, man. Unbelievable. And the thing is, they won't go to cover this protest, right? Like they won't. They want to make it look like Jordan Peterson, this mm. best-selling author, one of the largest platforms in the world. Um, they want to make it look like the people who support him are just few and far between and a bunch of fringe radicals. And that's not the case. However, if you do go looking for mainstream media coverage of Jordan Peterson, you're going to hear or you're going to see coverage of random busybodies complaining and trying to get him canceled still. They won't go to cover this, even though I'm reliably informed that Toronto is just teeming with journalists. Um, they're all over the place there, um, but they won't go cover this at the College uh, of Psychologists of Ontario, but they will cover attempts to have Jordan Peterson's Ottawa event canceled because it's being held at an NHL venue, because he's that big, by the way, he can sell out an NHL venue um, because it opposes the NHL's diversity and inclusion efforts 
experts say, which I mean, I don't know how you get to be an expert in this sort of stuff. Are you just like an online whiner? I think so. Um, part of the cancel culture mob. That's how you get to be an expert. But that's what they're covering. They're not covering the people who support Peterson. Um, they're not talking about our efforts to, um, I, I guess, mob the mic. Um, with uh, savepeterson.com where you can get the phone number to call the college or send them a, an email, a preloaded email really quick. Um, no, they will talk about um, some random guy complaining because this is at an NHL venue. And by the way, these people who don't like Jordan Peterson and want him canceled, they likewise think that the NHL is rife with toxic masculinity. So these people are not your friends, NHL, but you are probably going to bend to them anyways, aren't you? You know, I didn't know about that story, uh, Sheila. Thanks for flagging it. And this, of course, is the same uber-woke NHL that a few weeks ago sponsored some transgender hockey tournament. And uh, guess what happened, although you won't see a lot of media coverage. A biological male collided with a biological female, and she was knocked out, sprawled out on the ice. Gee, no one saw that coming, uh, did they? But I remember the NHL um, tweeting out uh, something about how they support uh, transgenderism, that trans women are real women, something along that nature. This um, gives me currency, Sheila, to justify that for the last few years, um, I used to be such a diehard uh, Leafs fan, even though it's been more than a half of a century of disappointment. But I haven't seen more than a single period in years of that hockey team, which I understand is a contender, but they'll probably be out in the first round. But nevertheless, I used to always, every Leaf game in Buffalo I used to go to, because you can't get the tickets here, I bought the merchandise, I lived and died with that team, and you know what? Um, I, the worst thing I can say is I just don't care anymore. I just don't care. And that is toxic for a professional sports club. A professional sports team either wants you to love them or even hate them. Because if you hate them, you know, fire the coach, fire the gentleman. That means you care. Right now, I don't give a rodent's rectum if they go out again in the first round. I could care less, Sheila, and it's because of this wokeism. Who, hockey, who is driving this in professional hockey, this transgender wokeism? It, it's, it's staggering to me, Sheila. Yeah, I don't want our daughters and sisters to be um, the fulfillment of some weirdo's fetishistic dream of body checking a woman. But that's yeah. what this comes down to. Uh, but yeah, Jordan Peterson, he is going to sell out if he hasn't already. The Ottawa Canadian Tire Center, wh where the Senators play. And so this is an NHL venue. He, imagine a speaker selling out an NHL venue. You might get Oprah to do it, maybe. I don't know. Enough people still like her new age nonsense. I guess. I don't know. Um, but d you can get Hillary Clinton to sell out the um, Canadian Tire Center. He will. And these people want him canceled. Uh, a handful of busybodies, but mostly the journalists who wrote this, I think, because he doesn't quote a lot of experts pointing out that this is um, the it's it, the NHL has these diversity policies and Jordan Peterson's viewpoints uh, of maybe not body checking women um, at the hands of men. Uh, those are incompatible with the NHL's policies. Oh, and you know what? I'm glad you talked about the sports reporting. Um Contrary to what you might think, because you think about football, basketball, baseball, hockey, lacrosse, and so on, that um, this would attract, um, oh, I don't know, masculine males uh, to write about it. But the truth is, it is so woke. It is so it's leftist. I, I, I can't even think of a right of center sports writer anymore, Sheila. I really can't. And they're all in with this garbage, right? Um, and you know, it, it's funny um, when we had the headline up about uh, Jordan Peterson that opposes the NHL's inclusion and diversity policy. Um, when the whole Black Lives Matter thing went into warp drive after the, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, I'll never forget the Leafs general manager, Kyle Dubas. He may, you know, when the Leafs were working out, they were all mandated to wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts. 
Um, God forbid anyone would don a shirt saying all lives matter. And he actually made the statement, Sheila, that he wished there were more black players on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now, that's the kind of statement that would make the late great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. roll in his grave because he was all about merit. He was all about being colorblind. And what's more, under the same ownership umbrella, we have the Toronto Raptors. I'm making a guess 85% of the roster is black. I don't have a problem with that. But it's a meritocracy. Could you imagine the coach or the general manager of the uh, Toronto Raptors saying, I wish we had more white dudes on this team? Yeah. Holy mackerel. Uh, They'd be promptly reminded of a certain movie from yesterday called White Man Can't Jump. That's why maybe there's not a lot of white guys on this team. But I'm tired of the hypocrisy and the double standard and how sports – much like movies once upon a time where I went for escapism, I'm instead greeted with more woke crap every Lectures. single day. You feel like you're being lectured to and you're yeah. like, why did I pay money to have some scold lecture me about things I fundamentally disagree with? Uh, the, by the way, this article is insane. Uh, the guy who wrote this should be really quite ashamed of himself. Uh, the con- He says these concerns, the concerns that it would cause harm to the queer community, I guess, in um, Ottawa by allowing Jordan Peterson to speak and allowing people to pay to hear him speak, says these concerns were echoed by several Ottawa-based organizations, including (laughs) the Ottawa Coalition to End Violence Against Women. When has Jordan (laughs) Peterson ever advocated for violence against women? Like, give me a break. Horizon Ottawa, Kind Space, Wisdom to Action, and the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity, who all penned a letter provided to Yahoo, so to this journalist. They gave him the, they gave him the story and he wrote it, basically. Opposing Peterson's event in hopes organizers and the city will act to protect vulnerable groups in Ottawa. That's a hell of a way of censorship, of saying censorship, by the way. Uh, It says, we are writing today to express our deep shock and disappointment with the choice of the Canadian Tire Centre to host Jordan Peterson for a forthcoming show, the letter reads. The letter also references Peterson's support of last year's Freedom Convoy. Oh, Oh. they're shoehorning all the causes in here. (laughs) Which caused, quote, equity-deserving communities within the region to experience the traumatic events of the occupation by uh, or of our city by the far right, including... Hundreds of incidents of harassment. Uh, Sheila, can we? Uh, do we have a definition for far right? I know you have one. It's a beautiful one. It's when you're right of center, mousy tongue, uh, yeah. right? But what? W- what? The way that word far right, alt right, is reason. tossed around. Um, yeah. It, like, what is the official definition? There is no official definition, yeah. and they use it for its vagaries. They can't say you're a neo-Nazi or you're a crypto-Nazi or you're whatever. They can't say that because that's actually a real tangible thing that requires there's a definition there. And if you don't fall within that definition, you cannot describe somebody as that. And it might even be libel. Um, So you say alt-right, far-right, whatever, because depending on where your viewpoint is on the spectrum, you might be far right, far over there. (laughs) If you're like way on the left. I, I want to go back to that laundry list of uh, woke mobsters calling out the Canadian Tire Centre in Ottawa. I think one of them was the Ottawa uh, Violence Against Women Coalition. Yeah, Did yeah. I get the name right? Um, yeah, yeah. What I might be wrong, but I'll bet on this. What do you want to bet, Sheila Gunn-Reed, that this Ottawa Violence Against Women Coalition is completely supportive of biological males. I'm talking about six foot oh, yeah, five sure. bearded, 300 pound dudes. For. Pardon me? Yeah. This yeah. is exactly what they're arguing for. That's why they don't want Peterson there is because he says dudes probably shouldn't hit women in sports. Yeah. And but, they're, but, they're mad about it. But my point is, what do you want to bet? They are supportive of those kind of men going to female oh, yeah. penitentiaries for women and even um, rape crisis shelters, right? Where... Literally, you're putting the fox in uh, with with the hens. I bet you they have no problem with that. And if you want to talk about violence against women, what is the biggest recipe for disaster but to have male offenders simply gaming the system 
without getting any hormone shots, without dicing and slicing their genitalia surgically, um, without even donning a wig, saying, I'm a chick, put me in with the woman. I bet you that organization would have no problem with that. And that causes violence against women. And when I say woman, I mean real biological woman. Yeah, I've got a real problem with these sports-based organizations to uh, want getting involved in wanting to cancel Jordan Peterson because there's one that was especially loud. Ottawa Pride Hockey, who knew there was such a thing, has worked to create a safer space for queer, trans, and non-binary hockey players of all <laughs> skill levels to play the sport we love. And yet, they say this is going <laughs> to cause violence and femicide, femicide against women. Excuse me, you people are advocating for people to, like, for men, biological males, to crush my 16-year-old daughter on the rugby field. So, uh, you know, I'm not taking any lessons from these people about violence against women. Their whole point is that men should be allowed to perpetrate violence against women if the guy calls himself Susie first. Unbelievable. And by the way, that hockey league you just mentioned uh, it, that's open to queer, trans, and non You know what? Great. Actually, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm, uh, that, I think, is probably the most fair thing of all, is if there is a specific um, league for men who want to identify as women to play against each other, as opposed to my daughter and other people's daughters. I, I think that might be the most fair solution, and I know Linda Blade says that too. Oh, you're, and you're right. Um, Linda Blade has said that, that when it comes to athletics, we have male and female divisions. The The only exception, and Twas Ever Thus, was equestrian and auto racing because in each case, it's the horse and the car that makes the difference um, and equalizes. Also sports shooting. Us ladies are better sports shooters than you guys are. Yeah, I'm kind of worried about that given the kind of stuff a lady <laughs> man so it is buying right now. But... but you have male, <laughs> female, and you have an open division. This is what Linda yeah. Blade says, doesn't she? Uh, yeah. And you know what, uh, Sheila? Um, I would tune into that. Um, no matter who you are or what you are or how you identify or what your gender preference is or your pronoun, anything goes. Um, I think it would be like a battle royale in the WWE. That This could be um, very entertaining in a perverse sort of way. Yeah, like the Royal Rumble. You know, when the bushwhackers come in and they just get heaved right out the other side. There's didn't gonna you, be some of that. <laughs> didn't, you, didn't you equate me to that bushwhacker? <laughs> yeah. It was the shortest, <laughs> I think it's the world record shortest appearance in the Royal Rumble. He went into the ring <laughs> and he went right. Oh, yep. for, forgive us, folks. We we do like to talk about wrestling. Well, enough about <laughs> this um, transanity, as I like to call it. Look at this. Wow. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Jugmeet Singh says, I know Pierre Polyev won't take questions from journalists, but Manitobans have questions and they deserve answers. Oh, my gosh. Sheila, this isn't the same Jugmeet Singh who refused to take questions from rebel news reporters at the You're last. me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know, if, uh, um, Olivia or um, Efren, I don't know if we have any clips of uh, Jugmeet Singh giving us, giving us the cold, cold shoulder, even though for the second time in as many attempts, we had a court order from the federal court to allow us into the leaders' debates. And uh, Jugmeet Singh, um, well, let, let's uh, let's show him in his own words. I can't remember you know who what? was. I'm, I, I think one of those is me. And ah. people give me a hard time because they're like, she you didn't ask him a real question. You just oh. lectured him. Yeah, I did. Because he had already shrugged off um, our journalists' questions twice prior. So I was like, I'm not even going to waste a question on this guy. I've got my 30 seconds. I'm going to remind him that he answers to all Canadians. So sometimes I get some questions out in the world and people are like, Sheila, you wasted an opportunity to ask Jagmeet Singh a question. Uh, he wasn't going to answer. So I thought I would make it clear to him that he actually works for Canadians and he wanted to be the prime minister of all Canadians, even conservative Canadians. So uh, this is Alexa asking her question. Wow. Well, let, let's roll some of that video evidence then, Sheila. Historiquement, le NPD s'est opposé aux grandes sociétés pharmaceutiques et aux sociétés milliardaires qui se sont enrichies grâce aux blocages comme Amazon et Walmart. Et le NPD était très attentif aux libertés civiles. 
y compris en étant pro-choix sous son propre corps. Pourquoi avez-vous embrassé les milliardaires de Big Pharma et abandonné votre philosophie de pro-choix? Euh, merci, mais je ne réponds pas aux questions de Revolus. Merci. Est-ce que vous pensez que euh, c'est une option de ne pas répondre à un média juste parce que le fait que vous ne nous aimez pas? Nous devons... Merci beaucoup. The question is from Rebel News. Before you tell me that you're not going to answer my question, I just want to say that I'm not here representing myself or my company. I'm here representing millions of Canadians who have real questions for you, like the one my colleague Alexa just asked. People who you would marginalize. Is your message to them that they are second-class citizens? Not at all. Sorry. You're saying the polls show that your party is between 15 and 20 percent. No party here on the stage tonight is even close to representing a majority of Canadians. This is an absolute divided country. Yet when conservative journalists like me ask you fair questions on behalf of Canadians, you insult us and refuse to answer a single word. You are like a child putting your hands over your ears. <laughs> Do you really think you can become prime minister by trying to freeze out any Canadian who disagrees with you? In your own writing, You only got 38% of the vote. Is this how you treat the other 62% of people who disagree with you? No. Thanks so much. Question. Oh, my God. Like I said, Sheila, pot, meat, kettle, kettle, meat, pot. This guy has the audacity, has the chutzpah, the sheer unmitigated gall to call out Pierre Polyev for not taking questions from journalists, or I guess in Jugmeet Singh's world, in his universe, a journalist is only a government-funded journalist. If it's uh, independent media, they don't count. Um, what a wicked man. What a hypocrite. Yeah, and I, I hope people realize why I asked him that question, because I was the third female journalist from Rebel News at that point. He had shrugged off two of our journalists with really good questions, and I thought, I'm not even going to waste a question on this guy. I'm just going to pose my lecture in the form of a question. Um, but yeah, he's he's mad because Pierre Polyev is going to interact with the Frontier Center for Public Policy, which is, they're conservative, but they're small government, pro-civil liberties, Uh, I wouldn't even say they're anti-vaccine. They're just pro-leave everybody alone. And he has the audacity to interact with them. Um, sorry, but they are the conservative equivalent probably of the Broadbent Institute. But the Broadbent Institute is so often funded by unions. This is sort of completely independent conservative. And he's going to be talking to the Frontier Center. Uh, good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad to see that Pierre Polyev is talking to conservatives outside of the establishment bubble of anybody laterally adjacent to Preston Manning. Um, I, I'm happy to see it. Um, but yeah, Jagmeet Singh, are you, do you think we're hard of remembering? We were all there when you wouldn't talk to Rebel News journalists because you don't like us. Yeah, and then, Sheila, to double down, I see another news item that is hand in glove uh, with this story. Manitoba Health Coalition is appalled, appalled, I tell you, Sheila, that appalled. Pierre Polyev is joining the extremist anti-vaccine and anti-science frontier center today in Winnipeg. We understand that he will not be taking questions. You know, I love those words. Look at them. Extremist, anti-vaccine, anti-science. You mean um, those who subscribe to the chestnut the left has loved for decades now? my body, my choice, or does that only apply, Sheila, to women terminating a baby? It doesn't apply to uh, getting jabbed for COVID-19. Do you know what kind of extremists are working with the Frontier Center for Public Policy? You have a, Frances Widowson, who um, is on the left, by the way. She's a professor on the left. And she was basically canceled for expressing her viewpoints around um, as certain indigenous issues. There's uh, Patrick Moore. He is an, a co-founder of Greenpeace. He's the kind of radical, radical that they don't want uh, Pierre Polyev talking to you down at the Frontier Center. You know what? <laughs> if, if Jagmeet Singh says not to talk to somebody, probably best to just talk to that person 
because I think he's got terrible, terrible judgment. He's the guy propping up the liberals. He's worried about who <laughs> Pierre Polyev's chumming around with. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Incredible, Sheila. Well, you know what? I think we should get to our second ad break and then go right to our um, chats. Uh, Super Chats, uh, assuming we have some because we're on a, we do. a hard deadline. Uh, I have to... Uh, uh, Bug Roth just let our naughty and snow. All uh, allegedly, I'm on Tucker Carlson uh, tonight. Tonight, and um, it's a pre-taping, so I have to hustle over to the uh, the other studio. And um, what are they talking about? I'm, all I'm going to say is, um, it's a certain somebody that's made the Halton District School Board an international laughing stock. Yes, it has to do with oversized mammary glands. They say sex sells. So tune in and you'll see. Uh, you, you'll you'll fill your boots with this one. So why don't we go to our ad and then we can uh, talk about our super chats and Sheila. My mug? I know. It's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see freedom focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is, without you and your generosity, there is no rebel news. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. Well, there you go. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask our super producers, do we have some uh, feedback? Yet? We have three. Got we got three. Got okay, well, let's yep. get right to them. Thank you. Okay, we've we've got one from David Menzies, super fan, president of the unofficial David Menzies fan club, <laughs> uh, population one, I think. Uh, Annalisa, 1964, <laughs> who has David Menzies in the bloodstream like an AstraZeneca <laughs> clot. She gives us 20 bucks. Wow. And she's, yeah, generous. She always is, though. My two favorite people, I'm... I am finally able to watch your show today because I'm homesick. Oh, well, I'm I'm sorry I picked on you a little bit for your taste in men. I hope you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she says, I sure have missed you. Oh, and my sweet Menzies, you still got that yummy going on. I think you just write this stuff, Annalisa, <laughs> so that I have to suffer through saying it. You know, Sheila, as I've oft uh, mentioned, when it comes to lovely ladies like Annalisa, 1964, uh, where were they in high school? You know, you when did I fine sold for yourself. No, you <laughs> did fine. You're doing better than you should with Lady Menzies. So don't start wistfully looking back at your life and wondering where all these women are. No, no, Sheila. That's the one you got is way too good for you. Oh, you know what? <laughs> you know, all these people, you know, when they're coming to the end of their life and they're in through their 90s and, you know, and they say, if I had to live my life all over again, I wouldn't do anything differently. Oh, man. Would I say to the reporter, get a, another chunk of full scap. I got so many things I would live differently, such as selling my comic book collection in high school so I could buy a used 74 Camaro to be more attractive uh, to the female demographic the Camaro failed and uh, as for that comic book collection Sheila if I hung on to it today I could buy a new Ferrari off the lot that's all I'm going to say about that <laughs> our lives are an accumulation of our choices and it led you to Lady Menzies and I think you have a pretty good life <laughs> In spite of yourself. Um, let's keep going. Uh, we've got Kane and Marcus is five bucks. Happy New Year to my favorite rebels. Sheila and David. Is Adam coming back? Yes, he is. He's on paternity leave because um, he's got a, a brand new baby at home. And uh, he'll be back very, very soon, early in the spring. Sheila, I'm sorry. We had a little bit of fade there. Can I ask you kindly to reread that uh, super chat? Okay. So it's Kane and Mark gives us five bucks says happy new year to my favorite rebels sheila and david is adam coming back and adam is coming back he's on paternity leave he's at home with a little one um and at rebel news we're pro family and we want um we want him to have the time that he needs with his little one before he comes back so he'll be back uh in the spring early in the spring 
And, and Sheila, in our not so brave new world, if Adam, a biological male, is on paternity leave, does that mean he's um, chest feeding the babies? No, <laughs> I think he's just taking care of the baby while his wife goes to work and, um, you know, enjoying his other two children also <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> Just being a dad, doing regular masculine dad things. Fantastic. Um, Good to see there's still somebody left on team heterosexual. <laughs> oh, I believe Adam is firmly both feet on team heterosexual with all those kids and that lovely wife. Again, yes. there's a man who did well for himself, by the way. <laughs> um, Georgie, Georgie, five bucks. I don't care about the politics of sports writers. Just don't sneakily put your politics in sports columns. Yes, exactly. David, I'm sure you remember Howard Cosell, though. Oh, yeah. And what did I mean? Howard Cosell was a lawyer by training. Um, but here's the thing. It's the double standard. Um, let me pick an example for you. And I called him out on this example and I got a nothing burger answer from him. Steve Simmons, who is a good sports writer. He works for the Toronto Sun. He condemned. He crucified Tim Thomas when that goalie was a member of the Boston Bruins and, and they won the Stanley Cup for not attending the White House when President Obama was in office. Uh, he, um, you know, went AWOL. And, uh, and you know what? Uh, I really believe regardless of who the president is, you should, if it's a you team victory, go. go en masse. But yeah. when Holtby, the goalie for the Washington Capitals, when he was a member of the Stanley Cup winning Capitals, and Trump was in office, Holtby uh, went AWOL, and Simmons um, held him up as a shining example of someone taking a stand. Do these guys even keep track of what they're writing? Because even though a decade had gone by, I sure remembered. And in Steve Simmons' world and in the world of woke progressive sports writers, no, that kind of double standard is nothing to be ashamed about. It's something to wear as a badge of honor. What a disgrace. Yeah, it's good, though, to see that this sort of double standard, uh, forgetting the things you previously wrote, um, infects sports writing and not just uh, political writing. Yeah. Um, because they do it all the time where they're like, would you take a vaccine that Trump developed? Probably not. And then, like, if you don't take the vaccine uh, right now, you're a bad citizen because the, there's a new president. Right. And it's the same people writing the same article. It's bizarre. Geez, with what you just said, Sheila, it sounds like you're quoting verbatim Bruce Arthur, one of the worst of the worst. It was a little bit. He's the first guy who comes to my mind when I think of terrible sports writers <laughs> and bad politics. <laughs> okay, well, I think that wraps up. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, well, Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you to our super producers, Olivia and Efren, uh, behind the board there. Uh, it is Friday the 13th, so if you're superstitious, take care. I wonder if the Port Dover Friday the 13th motorcycle ride is on. Oh. They, somebody, some hardcore bikers always show up, even though there is a, a bit of a snowstorm in the GTA. Uh, folks, what can I say? Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for tuning in. A special thank you for all that donated to us. And as always... Stay safe. Stay sane. I can tell you, 2023 is going to be better than 2022.